talking about Solomon. Amen? Remember, we looked at Solomon and some different aspects of his life. Remember, Solomon was a king. Third king of Israel, Solomon had everything at his disposal, right? We talked about Solomon being the true player of players, right? There's a lot of men and women out there that like to have more than one, I don't know, what do you call it? <laughs> Friends? <laughs> That's a good one. Friends, right? Solomon had 700 wives, 300 concubines. He had 1,000 women in his life, right? 1,000 women in his life. So not only did he have all the women he wanted, he had all the money he, he, he wanted. He talked about he had silver, he had gold. He had the finest of everything. How do kings live? They live good, right? They have the best of everything. So Solomon had it all. And what's interesting is what we were looking at it, with Solomon's life last week is that we, we look at his life and then he shared with us in the end of Ecclesiastes, the last chapter, he tells us about the conclusion he came to at basically when he became old in life after being able to indulge in anything he wanted. He basically said, I had it all. But what it really all comes down to is this. I had the women, I had riches, I had anything I wanted. But all that is really meaningless. It's all temporary. And then he goes on to tell us that really the only fulfillment in life is seeking after God. That's what he came to the conclusion he shared with us. You know, so many times we kind of get a little bit off track because we're, we're kind of putting maybe too much effort in one area. But really, you know, the main thing in our life is God should be the, the main Thing we put our effort into. Amen. And that's why we're here today. Amen. That, that's exactly why we're here, so that we can learn and grow in the things of God. We're honoring Him. This morning, we're going to be in the book of Ephesians chapter 3. And as you're turning there, I'm going to open up in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you this, this morning, Lord. We give you this uh, uh, we give you the glory as we dedicate this time to you. We ask you to bless this time. We ask you to show yourself real to us through your word. We give you glory and honor in the precious name of Jesus. And everyone says, amen and amen. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 3 because we're kind of building on what we looked at last week with Solomon and what Solomon dealt with in his life. He had it all, but yet he was doing his own thing. That's what the problem was. He had it all, but he was doing his own thing. And in the end, he comes to the conclusion that like, man... I shouldn't have been doing my own thing. I should have been following after God, and I knew better. Because why? Because from an early on, my father David taught me to seek after God. Remember we've seen that? I showed you that in the Word, where David, his father, who was king before him, tells him, Solomon, prove yourself a man. Follow after God. That's the best thing you can do. He started off well. Because the, the, you know, when he becomes a king, God has a conversation with Solomon. And he tells him, ask me anything. Anybody ever hear about a genie in a bottle? <laughs> How many wishes do you get? You get three, right? Can you imagine if God came to you and said, ask of me anything, anything, and I'm going to do it for you. Mind will start racing, right? What, what, what can I ask for? Solomon, he told God, give me wisdom. That's what he asked for. He said, give me wisdom to rule over your people. Because he understood that being king was a big responsibility to be over people that ultimately were God's people. He was just put over them, but he knew ultimately they were God's people. So he asked God, give me wisdom. And God says, because you asked for the one thing, not only am I going to give you wisdom, I'm going to give you everything that comes with it, which is long life and riches and honor, and the list goes on. You see how that works? You see how he asked for wisdom to rule over God's people, and yet God said, I'm going to give you the wisdom you asked for, but do you know what comes with it? All those other things come with it. So, we see Solomon's life last week. Today we're going to look at something a little bit different, but we are building on what we looked at last week with, with uh, Solomon in his life. We're going to look at Paul. And here's the setting. Paul is in prison. He's in prison for his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has all this time on his hands. So guess what he does? He spends time with God and, and reflecting with God and communicating with God. And God gives him 
all these things on his heart that he pins down here in the book of Ephesians. Right? Not only does he write the book of Ephesians from prison, he also writes the book of Colossians as well. Right? So God gives Paul all these things. But the thing is, Paul, what he wants to teach us, what he's learned from his life at this point in his life, that he's doing all these great things for God, that it lands him in jail. So here he is in jail, and he's learned all these lessons, and he wants to teach us what he's learned. And, and he wants to teach us many things, about what he's learned. The one thing that he's going to show us is how to live a godly life. And this is what he shares with us in the book of Ephesians. A godly life? Yeah, how do I live a godly life? Well, the, to live a godly life is to live a life following after Christ. And this is a new thing for us. Because see, many of us, we're not raised doing this. We're raised to follow a life following the world's standard, the world's patterns of things. Amen? So in life, the world teaches us, society teaches us all these different things, right? But ultimately, Paul is showing us that when you become a Christian, when you say, you know what, I, I, I want Jesus in my heart. I, I want to I follow after God, right? Right? He's saying that you've got to learn how to live differently than, what, than how you've been living. Because there's a lot of Christians out there that they get Jesus into their heart, they get Jesus into their life, but nothing changes in their life. And yet they're experiencing the same, all these issues and problems. Now, just because we get Jesus in our life and we start following after Him doesn't mean you're not going to have no problems. But what it does mean is that if you are truly learning how to live differently, that when you are going through those problems, He's going to be there with you every step of the way. And uh, another thing is that a lot of the problems that we used to get ourselves into, we're not going to be dealing with those things no more because we're not living that way, right? If we're following after God. And see, so Paul wants to teach us so many different things, but today we're just going to focus on a few. And one of the things that we want to focus on today is that when you live a life following after God, you need help. You can't do it in your own ability and power because why? Because we have limitations, right? We have limitations. We can only do so much. Think about it. How often do we see people quit things, right? They, they invest in something and they just quit after a period of time because he said, I can't do it no more. Whatever it is, I'll give you a perfect example. Come the beginning of January every year, what happens? People like to make a New Year's resolution. Oh, this is the year. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. One of the big New Year's resolutions for, mo for a lot of people is what? I'm going to lose weight. And I'm going to get into shape. And I'm going to join the gym. Right? Right? And so guess what? So come January, all these gyms start seeing an increase in memberships, which means money's coming in, right? And all of a sudden, you know, you go to the gym, and it doesn't matter what time you go, it's like, man, look at all these people that are here, all these New Year's resolution people, right? But that's okay. Come February, March, they're not going to be here no, no more. And that happens as the months go on you know, people start falling off, right? That, and that's just one example of people quitting something that they started, right? There are many things that we as people in life will start things, but we'll quit for some reason, right? We just lose the, the, the drive. We just, you know, we, we're, we're, we just don't have that desire no more. Or because of some challenge in our life, we, we kind of lose the motivation. It kind of falls down on us. It kind of, you know, breaks us down. Did you know I was supposed to be a boxing champion? Look at you guys. <laughs> what? Yeah, at the age of nine, I joined the local boxing gym. And I had to go every day to train. But what happened? What happened was I had a ride situation. I was nine years old. We lived on the other side of town. To get there in the afternoon was one thing because our babysitter stayed right in that area. But to get home was another thing because 
we lived on the other side of town. So after a while, a short while, transportation became an issue. So I couldn't go no more, right? And there went my hopes and dreams of being a world champion. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the thing is this, sometimes things happen, they're outside of our, how would you say? I'm trying to think of a word here. They're, they're outside of, of our, um, say again? Comfort zone, and eh, no, not the word I'm looking for. They're, they're outside of our, say that, what's? Control, control. Things happen that are out of our control. Nine years old, I, I didn't have a car. I didn't, I, 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 it was outside of my control. I couldn't do anything, right? But there are times where things are within your control. That's a different story. But let me show you something here in the book of Ephesians. Let, let's go to the book of Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to start here in verse number 14. Ephesians 3.14, Paul says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Does everybody know that that's the way you're supposed to pray, on your knees? Because if you don't pray on your knees, God can't hear you. I hear some people, what? No, I'm just pulling your leg. Did you know that there's nowhere in the Bible that says that you have to be in a particular position to pray? Some people think that you have to be in a position to pray. You know, being on your knees like Paul's talking about. You know, being like this with your eyes closed. If you open your eyes, God's not going to hear you. Don't, go, don't open your eyes. Close your eyes. Right? The Bible, nowhere in the Bible does it say you have to be in a certain position to pray. And I'm going to show you this in the Scripture so you can see for yourself. God is not concerned with your position when you pray. Right? Hold your place there. We will come back to Ephesians, but let's go to Genesis chapter 18. And we're going to go here to verse number 22 in the book of Genesis. So Genesis chapter 18, we're going here to verse number uh, 22. And in verse 22, look at what the, what the word shows us right here. It says... Did I say Genesis 18? Yeah, 18, verse 22. It says, Then men turned away from there and went toward Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. See, so what's happening is Abraham stood before the Lord because he was praying for the people that were living in Sodom at this time. And the reason being is, God revealed to Abraham that they were going to be destroying this place because it was filled with wickedness. So Abraham was talking with God. He stood before God. He wasn't on his knees, right? He was, he was having a conversation with God, but he was standing, okay? Point number one, right? In regards to what position should we be in when we pray? Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 8. And in 1 Kings chapter 8, we're going to go to verse number 22. Okay, 1 Kings 8.22. So here in 1 Kings 8.22, the word says, Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord. Uh-oh, now it's getting very serious. He's at the altar of God. In the presence of all the assembly of Israel, right? And spread out his hands towards heaven. What position was Solomon in? He was standing. He was standing before God, right? At the altar. The altar is where you do what? Where they would go and give sacrifices, right? The altar. So we see Abraham standing. We see Solomon standing. Let me show you another position. Let's go to 1 Chronicles. This is uh, after 2 Kings. Keep going to your right. We're going to go to 1 Chronicles chapter 17. And we're going to end up here in verse number 16. I just want to show you from the Word of God that there is no specific position you need to be in when you pray. Right? 1 Chronicles chapter 17. We're going to go here to verse number 16. Look at what the Word shows us right here. It says, Then King David... So we looked at Abraham, he was standing. We looked at Solomon, he was standing. But look at here, David, verse 16. King David went in and sat 
before the Lord. And he said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me this far? David goes in to pray to God, and he does what? He sits. So do you, are you guys seeing that you could stand or you can even sit? I'm going to show you one more position. Right? Let's go to the book of Matthew. And we're going to go to chapter 26. Right? Matthew 26. You know what's funny? In Buddhism and in some other of these Far East religions, they have different positions that they pray into. Right? They have all these different positions that they get into when they pray. Right? Um, I don't know all the, the reasons why, but supposedly being in certain positions helped them get in tune, right, with the universe, right? So it's kind of funny that these other belief systems do that. Here in the book of Matthew chapter 26, we're going to verse 39. Okay. This is uh, Matthew 26, verse 39, and look what the word says. It's talking about Jesus here, right? And he went a little farther, farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it's possible, let this cup come from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So we see Jesus fell on his face when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. So we got people standing, we got people sitting, got Jesus there on his face, right? The thing is this, we see Paul telling us that he got on his knee, right? Verse 16, oh, I'm sorry, what were we at here? We were in Ephesians 3. Let me catch up to you guys here. Ephesians 3.14. It says, for this reason... I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, so Paul is telling us he bowed his knee to God. It's a sign of respect, right? What happens when people come before royalty? What do they do? do you, if you ever uh, went to meet Queen Elizabeth in England, they say, hey, you know what? You're cordially invited to Buckingham Palace, and we're going to let you have lunch with Queen Elizabeth herself. And so you get over there to Buckingham Palace and you're going to walk up to the queen and be like, hey, queen, give me a high five. What's going on? Right? Are y'all, give me a fist bump, Queen Elizabeth. Right? They're going to tell you before you even get to her palace, her helpers, they're going to tell you about proper etiquette, how you come in before you meet the queen. And they're going to probably tell you it is a sign of respect that when you come before the queen, you do one of these little bow your head as a sign of respect, right? It's just what you do. They'll teach you how to do that when you go before the queen. So Paul is telling us that he went with a, with a, on his knee, a sign of respect. Now, I know there's some people, they like to you know, pray on their knees, right? Does it mean that it's any more holy than that if you were laid out on your face like Jesus did? Or if you were sitting down like David or standing like, like uh, Solomon Right? Or Abraham? So the point being here is this. I hope you'll, you see this. Paul bowed his knee to God. It was a sign of respect. But even more important than bowing to God when we come before Him in prayer is that we bow our hearts. Right? To His will. Isn't that even better? What does that mean to bow your heart to God? It's a... It's a um, I'm trying to think of the word here. I'm just out of loss of words today. <laughs> right? To bow your heart before God is not something that you do physically or literally, right? But to bow your heart before God is basically to, to have, like, to come before God with, a, like, a, you know, a humble, open heart. Like, you know, you're like, oh, you know, coming before God, right? To bow your, the knee of your heart. I hope you guys understand that expression. I hope I'm not causing you to be confused here, right? Okay. So that's what's important when you come before God is that your heart is in the right position, ready to, to receive from God, ready to be humble, right, before the Lord. So remember, as we're looking in Ephesians 3, there is no special 
position you need to be in when you pray. I showed you examples of people standing before God. I've showed you people of sitting before God. I showed you an example where Jesus was on his face before God. Right? Anybody ever been in that position before with police? They do that. They do that. They're, right? Get on your face. You see the videos. Or you were in the video? Oh, okay, we won't go there. <laughs> Bottom line, there is no specific position, right? Go there with the right heart, the right attitude. That's what we're focusing on. Okay, so we're moving on. We're in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. We set the stage. Paul is in prison, and he's learned some lessons, and he wants to share with us what he's learned about trying to, you know, utilize the power of God Better. Because in our own ability, we only have so much strength. We have limits. And too many of us try to live our lives, we try to live this Christian life with these limitations that we have. And so when the problems come or when the temptations come, right, we're faced with this reality, we're like, you know, we, we, we sometimes, we fall, right? You know, initially we're like, no, I don't want to do that. I know I shouldn't do that. But guess what? We're not strong enough to handle these things. But you are strong enough. You just got to know where to tap into the power. Amen? And that's what Paul wants to show us here. And that's what we're looking at. We need to learn how to tap into God's power because then you'll be empowered. Amen? You'll be strengthened. So Paul, in these uh, few verses we're looking at in chapter 3, he's going to show us four things, but we're going to focus on one. Right? He's showing us four things. So in verse number 14, he says, For this reason I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 15, from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth is named. See that? We're part of a family. Right? When we make Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, right? that's why we call each other brother and sister, because we're brother and sisters in the Lord. But guess what? We're also family with those that are in heaven as well. We're one family. Amen. So that's what Paul is telling us here in verse 15. From whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Verse 16. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. Get this. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened. To be strengthened. How do you get strengthened? By the riches of His glory. That don't make sense right now, but we're going to break this down. See, Paul is saying, you and I need to be strengthened. Because that's the only way we're going to be able to live this life on earth, right? To be able to live a life following after God and to please Him. Because if we do it in our own, our own ability, we're going to miss it. We've missed it time and time again trying to do it on our own. But it's when we tap into God's power, we let Him empower us, now we can overcome those things that have hindered us, whatever they may be. And you know, the interesting thing is we all struggle, right? We all struggle with things. For one person, their struggle is different than the other person's because that's just the way we are. We're different like that. But we all struggle. The thing is this, in those struggles, if you learn how to tap into the power of God, you can overcome them. But you've got to learn how to tap into the power of God. And this is what Paul is telling us. He's saying in verse 16 that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with, my, excuse me, with might through his spirit in the inner man. The inner man. In, in, in the uh, NIV translation, it doesn't say the inner man in verse 16. It calls it the inner being. Okay? Some people call it the spirit man. Right? That is us. Right? Not who we see on the outside. This is a physical body. But what's on the inside, that is us at the core right there. The inner man. The spirit man. The, 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 the us that, that people can't see on the outside. It's on the inside. And see, the thing is this, is that many of us don't know how to strengthen the inner man. 
We focus on the outer man, right? What you see in the mirror. That's what we focus on. You stand in the mirror and you're like, oh, I look so good. God's gift to, to the world. Or you stand in front of the mirror and you're like, oh, man, got to lose some weight. Oh, I didn't see that stretch mark the other day. Oh, you start looking at all, oh, I got a gray hair. You know, you start looking at all your imperfections, right, in the mirror. Thing is this, we focus on what we see on the outside. We need to learn to focus on what's on the inside. There's a difference right there, amen? We need to focus on the inner man, on the inner being. And Paul is sharing that with us. That's where the focus needs to be. Right? That is where the focus needs to be. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Right? In Romans chapter 8, verse number 9, look at what the Word shows us here. Romans 8, verse number 9. Did I say Romans 8, 9? Okay. Okay, yes, there, there you go. Romans 8, 9. It says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. There's a difference between being in the flesh and being in the Spirit. We're going to see that right now. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Right? So in other words, how does God dwell inside of us? How does he dwell inside of us? Well... The, the Word of God tells us that when we invite the Lord into our hearts and make Him Lord of our lives by an act of our will and by confession, He comes into our, in, into our hearts, into our bodies, right? How do we know that? Well, what does the Word say right here? In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says... That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Right? So you just don't believe in God with your heart. You've got to also confess with your mouth. It's two parts to that, right? And then when we do that, we receive the Lord into our hearts. Right? Think about it. I love this example Pastor Samuel has used over the years. I always reference it all the time myself. When two people get married, do they just look at each other and say, ah, I believe we're married, right? I believe we're married now because we want to be married. No, they each have to confess the other one and receive them as husband, receive them as wife. That is why when people get married, they say, do you take this man to be your, wife, your husband? Do you take this woman to be your wife, right? And then you hope that the person says yes, right? <laughs> or I do, right? So how does a, a man and woman get married? Well, they, they, they exchange vows, right? And they say something. They receive each other as husband and as wife, right? So in other words, when we invite Jesus into our hearts, right? We, we say something. We say, Jesus, you know, I invite you to come in. Because he won't go into anyone's heart unless he's invited, there are so many people out there today that don't believe in Jesus or they don't want anything to do with Jesus and God respects their wishes. He doesn't force himself on anybody. But if you say, you know what, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. Guess what? He comes in. And so when we do that, right, we've seen going back to Romans chapter 8, like Paul is telling us, but you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. And if indeed in the Spirit of God dwells in you, now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So in other words, God starts to dwell inside of us, right? His Spirit. And he shows us right here in verse 9 that you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. So in other words, we got to stop learning to live, or we got to stop living, following after what the flesh wants, those uh, uh, fleshly desires, right? And follow the leading of the Spirit. And we're going to get there. I, trust me, we're, we're going to get there right now. So, so the thing is this. Paul is telling us about this power. Right? This power. Paul, Paul desires us 
to have this power. See, in Acts 1.8, we see that the Word of God says that... Let's go to Acts 1.8. Let's go to Acts 1.8. I don't like paraphrasing. In the book of Acts chapter 1, verse 8, look at what the Word of God says right here. It says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, all of Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. You shall receive power. Does anybody remember when we got that power? Right? When Jesus left the earth, He left us with the Holy Spirit. In, in other words, Jesus left the earth, but He gave us the Holy Spirit because He didn't want us to be powerless. And so He's saying, when you receive the Holy Spirit, you'll receive power. Amen? Power is what He's saying we'll receive when we receive the Holy Spirit. Think about it. Jesus performed His ministry on this earth in the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to show you right now. Let's go to Luke chapter 4, verse 1. What's interesting is this. Before Jesus was empowered with the Holy Spirit, He didn't perform one miracle. Remember, He lived on planet earth for how long? 33 years. And in the first 30 years of his life, Jesus did not perform one miracle. He didn't heal anybody. He didn't raise anybody from the dead. He didn't multiply food. He didn't do any of those great things we read about in the Gospels until, until he was empowered with the Holy Spirit. Let's go to, what did I say, Luke 4? Okay, let's go to Luke 4, verse 1. Look at what the Word says. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. This was right after he got baptized. Right? He got baptized. His cousin John baptized him. But see, the baptism that he received was what? He got baptized with the Holy Spirit. A whole different thing. A whole other message. But the point I want to show you is that the Lord Jesus, remember, he walked this earth as a man like you and I, and didn't use any of his divinity on the earth for the first 30 years. All he did was operate as a regular human being like you and I. But at the age of 30, he gets baptized, and the Bible shows us here, he gets filled with the Holy Spirit. And what does the Holy Spirit do? It empowers him to do what he's going to do the next three years of his life on the earth, and that is to do the works that he did. So the Holy Spirit... It empowers us to do things. And that's what I'm trying to show you this morning. I know it can be a little bit of a heavy message or a little bit like, what are you talking about? But I want you to hopefully get something this morning that you don't have to be living your life in your own ability. Because how far does that get us when we try to do things on our own? I could tell you from my own experience, when I do, did things on my own, I only got so far. But the minute that I gave my life to the Lord and said, Lord, I'm going to follow after you. Show me the way and I'm going to follow. And as soon as I started doing that, he started showing me things and helping me. Life got better. Didn't mean I didn't have no more problems, but it meant that I wasn't in it alone. And it meant that he was going to help me and give me solutions. And we've been going forward ever since. And God wants to do that for each and every one of you. But you have to take the words of Paul like Paul is saying and learn how to be strengthened. He showed us that in, in um, what were we in? Ephesians 3.16, right? He wants us to be strengthened. So Jesus didn't perform no miracles until he was empowered with the Holy Spirit. See, this is our only resource for Christian living. It's the only one. You could pray more. You could read your Bible more. You can do all these things that are all good for you, but the one resource that you have for empowerment is the Holy Spirit, is tapping into the Spirit of God. Amen? So think about it. The book of Acts showed us in 1.8 that you'll receive power, right? You'll receive power. And this, in the book of Acts, it showed us the importance, if you read the entire book of Acts, the importance of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church Everything changed for the church because of the Holy Spirit. 
See, the book of Acts is, is a time when Jesus was resurrected uh, from the cross. He went to heaven, and now all his disciples are left to continue his work. He's gone. But he left the Holy Spirit because they needed to be empowered. And then we see in the book of Acts what ended up happening with the disciples as they continued the work of Jesus after he left. They were doing the exact things he was doing. They were laying hands on people. They were getting healed from sicknesses and diseases. They were raising people from the dead. They were doing all these great miracles and works because they were empowered with the Holy Spirit. See? And that same Holy Spirit that empowered Jesus, that empowered the disciples, empowers us. But if we don't know how to use it, if we don't know how to tap into it, does us no good. Right? Does us no good. And that is why we got to take the words of Paul and learn how to apply them. See, what did the word show us in Ephesians? That the power of the Spirit is given to us according to the riches of His glory. That's what verse 16 said. The power is given to us according to the riches of His glory. That's what it tells us here in Ephesians 4.16. Right? That He would grant you according to His riches of His glory to be strengthened with might through the, His Spirit in the inner man. See, the power of the Spirit is given to us. Right? See, when Jesus returned to glory to be with the Father, what did He do? He gave us the Holy Spirit. Right? The Holy Spirit was sent down. And the Holy Spirit is available to the inner man, right? The inward being that, we're talk that I was talking about. That's the spiritual part of man that God dwells in, inside of us, right? Let's go to Ephesians 2.1. Look at what the Word shows us in Ephesians 2.1. It says, And He made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. You see that right there? He made alive those who were dead in trespasses and in sin. In other words, the inner man of a lost sinner is dead. Sure, we still sin, but we're not lost no more. Because why? Because we've been spiritually reborn when we receive Christ into our lives. But those who've rejected Jesus, those who've rejected Him, they're saying the inner man, they're, they're lost right here. It says... And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and in sin. We were dead spiritually before opening our heart to the Lord. The minute we opened our heart to God and said, All right, God, you're welcome to come into my life. You're welcome to come into my heart. You're no longer dead. You're now alive. But see, now we've got to learn how to live with this power that Paul's talking about. Right? So that's a process. Right? So now... We come alive when Christ is invited in. But now the thing is this. We've got to learn some things. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. 1 Timothy 4, 7. We start winding down here. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. Look at what the Word says. In 1 Timothy 4, 7, the Word says, But reject profane and old wives' ta fables and exercise yourself towards godliness. What? I don't like going to the gym. That's okay. This is spiritual exercise. Think about it. Spiritual exercise right here is what we're seeing. Right? See, we've got to exercise our spirit man on the inside. In other words, if we don't exercise him, he ain't going to get strong. He's going to stay weak, and we're going to continue to follow what the flesh wants to do. And the flesh wants what it wants, and it's going to lead us the wrong direction. We don't follow the leading of the flesh, which is our feelings, emotions, right? Those desires. We follow the leading of God, the spirit of God. So, for time's sake, we're not going to go there, but we're going to learn, or we learned about the spirit man. See, our spirit man, although it's on the inside, you can't see him. The spirit man, the Bible tells us, he can see. The spirit man can hear. The spirit man can feel. The spirit man can taste. 
is what the scriptures tell us about our spirit man. But see, if you're not able, able to hear with the, 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 the spirit man or the spirit being or your inward man, all these different terms we have for them, if you're not able to hear from the inside, you're not able to see, you're not able to touch or smell, while well, something's going on there, you're, he's not being developed. Right? He's not being developed and he's got to get developed in order for you to be able to rely on the spirit man. Amen? Okay, so we put too much emphasis on the outer man. Right? But we've got to start putting emphasis on the inner man. It's the inner man that's going to make us succeed. Amen? And so right here we've seen in 1 Timothy 4.7 it says, But reject profane and wives' tales. Exercise yourself toward godliness. Look at verse 8. For bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promises of the life, and now is, and of that which is to come. Right? we got to exercise our spirit man. Amen? we got to learn to exercise him. Okay, so now, how do we have this Holy Spirit empower the inner man? Right? How do we do that? It means that our spiritual facul faculties, right? Spiritual faculties are controlled by God. Does anybody know what that word means? Faculty, right? You hear at school, they said, oh, we're having a faculty meeting. Or can you come to the faculty meeting? That word faculty, all it means is basically faculty it is a body, right? A faculty, right? It's a, it's a body. So the thing is this, we have to let the Holy Spirit, we have to let Him empower us, but that means the way we do it is letting God start to con have control over our lives. That's a challenge, I know. It's not easy. But see, the way you give God control is you tell Him, Lord, not my will be done, but Your will be done. Help me. Help me to follow You Help me to, to, to let you lead me and guide me. Because when I try to do things on my own and when I try to do things, it just doesn't work. So you need to teach me on how to give that control over to you. That's the hardest thing for us people to do. It's hard because we want to be in control. We want to be in the driver's seat, literally, right? I'll tell you what, that has been one of the hardest challenges I've had of giving up control to God. But as I've learned to give control of my life to God, guess what? It gets easier. And then you get to the place where you're like, all right, God, you're in the driver's seat. You're in control here, right? But it's a process that has to take place. It's not going to happen overnight. But the thing is, when we benefit, when we let God have control, when we let Him lead and guide us, right? He's not going to do you wrong. See, a lot of people have a misunderstanding. Oh, you know, God just wants to control you. He wants to ruin all your fun. He wants you to be a robot. That's the furthest thing from the truth. He wants to help you. He wants to see you succeed. But the thing is this, is that when we hesitate to follow Him and give Him control, we're holding ourselves back. It's like being on the fence, right? Not, not wanting to, you know, make a decision there. See, we got to give up that control. And as we give up the control, he, looks, or he wants nothing but what's best for you. He's not going to harm you. He's not going to try to get over on you. See, we have this misunderstanding of God sometimes, right? We try to treat him or we look at him the way people, uh, we look at people. Right? Because we've been done wrong by people. We've been hurt by people. We've seen people try to use us, take advantage of us. The list goes on. God is not like that. But see, we try to take that experience we have with people and put it on God, thinking that we're, God's going to do us wrong, and so we don't want to trust Him. Well, see, we've got to get away from that. Amen? We've got to get to the place where we start to learn to trust God. Because that's the only way we're going to be able to do it. Amen? So let's go back to Ephesians. I know we went all over the place here, but I was trying to show you some things. So we're going back to Ephesians chapter 3. In Ephesians chapter 3, we started in verse 14. It says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now we know that Paul was bowing physically, but we talked about when you pray, you don't got to be, you don't have to bow or you don't have to uh, sit, stand, or you can be in any position you need to be in to communicate with God. But Paul is telling us he bowed his knee, sign of respect. The most important thing that we looked at, we want to bow our hearts. We want to be in that right position with our heart when we come before God. Right? And then we've seen here in verse 16 that He would grant us according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man. God wants to empower us. He wants to strengthen us. And that happens here in the inner man. Right? And He says here in verse 17 that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love. See, now he's going on to some other points that we're, we're not really focusing on because we were focusing on the first point, which is strength. In these first few uh, verses that we've looked at or been looking at, Paul is sharing four points with us. We've looked at verse 16, which we, we stayed on, and that is strengthened, to be strengthened. But in verse 17, he, Paul is now talking about depth. Depth. That Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith being rooted and grounded. And how our roots? Roots go down. The further a root goes down from a plant or a tree, the more what? The more stronger it will be. Right? Depth. Verse 18 tells us about apprehension. It says, May he be able to comprehend with all saints what is the width, length, depth, and height. Right? He's talking about to be able to grasp. Right? Verse 18 and some of 19 talks about being able to grasp. And then lastly in verse 19 he says, To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now he's going on to talk about there's going to be fullness. See, when you learn how to be strengthened, when you learn about how to, you know, get deep roots with God, when you learn how to grasp, you know, then you're going to end up seeing this fullness that he's talking about right here. Like I said, there's a whole lot of things going on here, but for time's sake, I just wanted to mention them. Go back, read it. But Paul is sharing some truths with us, you know, and the main thing that, that he's hammering home is that we don't have to try to do this Christian walk on our own. We can be empowered with the Holy Spirit. But see, that's something that happens on the inside with our inner man. That's something that we got to learn how to do. Then we got to learn how to exercise the inner man. Because if you don't exercise him, he's never going to get strong. Right? So it's a process that happens. But the thing is this. Take with you that God wants to empower you. He wants to strengthen you. But the only way that's going to happen is if you allow him to do it on the inside. On the inside. That's where it takes place. Right? So, continue or to work on your relationship with the Lord, continue to let Him build up the inner man so that you can start to exercise that power that we've been talking about. This power that comes from God, it's dynamic. Dynamic. In that not only will you be able to get through things in life, but you'll be empowered to help others. And that's what it all comes down to. To being strengthened to the point where you have enough strength, not only for yourself, but you got enough strength for somebody else. That's, that's getting deep right there. When you start thinking about others and not just yourself. Because a lot of people need help out there. But if we can't even help ourselves, how are we going to help them? Amen? We need the strength that the Holy Spirit gives us. God is good. Amen? Oh, we thank you, Lord. Let's pray. If I can have everyone just bow their heads, close their eyes. Lord, we